I'm speaking how black women must operate in white male spaces. Okay. <laughs> My name is Tyree Baker. I am a senior and an academic mentor for HGS 2.0. My name is Kai. I'm a junior and an academic mentor for HDS. My name is Kailani, aka KK. Um, I'm also an academic mentor for HDS. And we would like to welcome our wonderful guest, Ms. Jamil Hill. We have several of your fans here today, but we do have a couple of people who just came on to listen and learn. So do you mind giving us a brief bio on yourself and letting everyone know just how amazing you are? <laughs> Okay, well, thank you uh, for uh, the warm introduction and for thinking I'm amazing. <laughs> um, but uh, again, my name is Jamel Hill, and currently right now I'm a contributing writer for The Atlantic. I also host a podcast on Spotify called Jamel Hill is Unbothered, where I interview a lot of very notable people uh, from Daniel Kaluuya to Lee Daniels to Taraji Henson, a lot of really um, amazing people that I'm sure a lot of you know and, and more importantly would love to hear their story so make sure you check it out it's on Spotify. Uh, I also um, co-host a show on Vice called Carrie and Jamel Won't Stick to Sports. Um, we just wrapped season one so it's not currently on television but we'll be back uh, soon um, and it was on every Wednesday night on Vice and so that was a lot of fun but overall I've been in media now for 22 years I spent 12 years at ESPN. Uh, I had a 10 year career in newspapers where I was a columnist and also covered uh, you know, college football and college basketball because sports journalism has been my life uh, for these 20 plus years. Um, but uh, I know also I'm from Detroit and I graduated from Michigan State. So there's the short um, and sweet of it. And I'm just really pleased to be here and thank you all for having me. What a bio. <laughs> um, my first question for you, though, is what sparked your passion for sports writing? Well, um, what sparked it was my own interest in sports. Uh, I was one of those girls who was a neighborhood tomboy uh, growing up in Detroit. And so I love to play sports. I love to watch sports. And I also love to read. I was a voracious reader. And because I'm 7,000 years old, back in those days, we did not have the internet. And so in order to keep up with your sports teams, you had to start, you had to read the newspaper. You need to watch the news or read the newspaper. Um, and, you know, because ESPN was barely getting started. You know, ESPN started in 1979. I was born before there was ESPN. But when I was coming of age as a sports fan, uh, ESPN was still very much in its infancy stage. So the thing was to pay attention to the local media. Plus, I was a fan of pretty much all of the Detroit teams, with the exception of the Detroit Lions. Um, and so that was how I developed a love for newspapers. And when I was in high school, I took high school journalism. Um, and I was kind of hooked after that. And so I majored in journalism. I had a bunch of internships. Um, and I worked as a a, a print journalist um, with a concentration in, in sports. Um, you know, I've been doing this professionally since 1997. So, um, you know, I, I was very fortunate because I had a very straightforward path to what I do. The television stuff that happened was all purely by accident. And I'll be completely candid. I mostly got into television, not mostly. I, the 100% reason I got into TV was because the money was good. It really didn't have to do with me just wanting to be on TV, but um, there's kind of a bit of a cap on what they pay a writer. What they pay a, um, you know, somebody in TV can be infinite, <laughs> okay? So when I got more television opportunities at ESPN, it was very clear that the medium was very powerful and the money was good. So why wouldn't I, especially since I was given the same kind of commentary, um, you know, in print, I was just saying it on TV. That was just the difference and making a lot more money doing it. So, um, but again, I was very lucky because I knew what I wanted to be and I knew at an early age. And so that allowed me to get started and to keep going and to always do this. I've only had two other jobs that have not dealt with being a sports writer. Uh, one was I delivered phone books in college because I was broke. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I know. Uh, and I also uh, worked the snack counter at the YMCA when I was in high school. Other than that, every single job I've had 
have been in journalism and or media. That's really that's amazing. amazing. Like, I really, really hope that's the same way for me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Um, but also, also we would like to, to ask people, can they just keep their mics muted, please? Um, but I will mention, um, so after receiving punishment and backlash on your opinions in ESPN, do you feel like you have to tiptoe around what you really feel? No, <laughs> which is uh, um, which is why that was a, a good learning lesson, you know, for me. I never have felt that way, by the way. That wasn't just new. Um, you know, of course, there's going to be lines that you know that you have to, you know, really be cognizant of. Um, you know, you're in corporate media, so there's going to be some give and take and some compromise with that. And I think a lot of it depends on the kind of leverage that you have. I mean, when all the Trump controversy happened at that point, I'm already, uh, you know, a, a decade or so into my journalism career. I don't know if I would have tweeted the same thing if I were, you know, 26 years old, because I would not have had as much leverage, not as much equity in the business, um, certainly not as much protection either. And so, um, you know, that's, kind of how it works is that you wind up building a career and within that you build up some equity and so when you do choose to use your platform or use your voice then the proper mechanisms are in place so that you can get as much protection as you possibly can but even then you're only protected so much I mean the day that I tweeted that I could have lost my job that day but um you know eventually uh what that put into motion was the fact that I, I already wasn't happy um, at ESPN because I wasn't I wasn't happy specifically doing Sports Center. My time at ESPN was great, but at the time I was hosting the Six O'clock Sports Center and I didn't really like it. And what all that did was accelerate me getting to the point that I always wanted to be at. And so now that I am, I have much more ownership over my talent. Um, everything that I'm doing is because I want to do, not because I have to do. And now I don't really care <laughs> about, you know, backlash and all those things. I've been through the worst of it. You know, that's, that's the thing about going through something like that is that it gives you an extraordinary amount of perspective. I mean, the president asked for me to be fired. What level of backlash is going to exceed that? Probably none, right? So what would I have to fear at this point? Um, and that's not to even make it seem like I'm out here just saying reckless things for the for reckless sake, but it is to say that I never really think about the reaction from the standpoint of fear. Uh, I think about is what I'm saying true? Is it smart? Is it thoughtful? Is it even at times is it helpful? And that's what I judge it by. I don't judge it by the backlash, and because you know that's the thing, especially if you plan to if you're a journalist and you plan to get in a commentary. Uh, as I did, and making that uh, transition over from just being a, uh, you know, a objective reporter and just the facts and that kind of thing, but you want to jump into commentary and give your opinion. It, it's like that old adage where they tell you to dance like nobody's watching. Well, you kind of have to approach giving your opinion the same way, because if you start tempering your opinion based off how you think you might react, you're going to be pretty bad at it, because people want authenticity, they want genuineness, they want truth, and you can't shade the truth or massage the truth just to make people like you or even to make people dislike you. You have to say what's real. And that's the part that I'm focused on. It's like not really the reaction. It's about, am I saying something that's real and true and authentic? And as long as I feel like everything is meeting that threshold, I can deal with whatever backlash comes my way. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for our next question, can you actually talk more about like the importance of controlling your narrative and pushing or pursuing your passion and just believing yourself in general? Just that whole thing. So, I mean, the best piece of advice that I can pass along to you all is, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people come to college and, and certainly I saw this when I went, went to college as well. I always used to study the engineering majors and I, I'm not picking on people who, who decide to major in engineering 
God bless you, you can do math. That was never my testimony. Um, but it was always interesting when I looked at the engineering majors because I knew most of them picked engineering because just like I did, they were aware of that list that comes out that shows you how much each profession makes and who's at the top, who's at the bottom. I would imagine, especially today, there's a lot of scientific things that are towards the top, especially things dealing with STEM. You know, anything with STEM is probably at the top, right? Um, maybe medicine, all those sorts of things. Um, but I knew that certain people, a lot of people, were picking these engineering majors based off the fact that engineers, when they came out of college at the time, we're talking about, you know, mid-90s, they were making close to $50,000 a year. That was what the average entry-level engineering job paid at the time. By comparison, the average journalist salary when I was in college was $19,000. It was toward the bottom of that same list in careers. But what I found is after two years, a lot of those engineering majors were dropping out of the major because they didn't really like it. They just picked it because of the money. So I say this to say is that if you pick something to focus on and you're passionate about it and you love it, eventually you're going to make money. I've never made $19,000 a year. Lowest I made was 22. So I was ahead of the game by three grand. But I say, you know, the whole point is that while I never expected to wind up at ESPN, if I hadn't been at ESPN, I would have been okay. And I picked something that I loved. I picked something that I would do for free. I picked something that I saw myself doing for a lifetime. And many times, and look, uh, colleges haven't made it easy because the cost of college, I know you guys feel under a lot of pressure as soon as you get there, that you got to pick something, you got to stick with it. And even though you will see every red flag that you don't really like it, you will stay with it anyway because you feel like you've got too much money and time invested and you don't want to just discard it. It feels starts feeling like a bad relationship where you're like, oh, all you think about, well, I put all this time in. Well, what difference does it make if you're not going to be happy, right? And so uh, I just would encourage you all to find something you really care about and not worry about the money. And I know that's really easy for me to say as somebody who's already an established professional. So I note the immediate hypocrisy of this. But I, I do think it works. And I do think it's true that everybody I've known that has picked something based off passion and love has usually been pretty successful about it. Because those things that you love and you're passionate about it, you're going to work harder than everybody else. You are going to often be more creative. You're going to find avenues to do what you have to do. You're going to put yourself on the line for it. So that's the least that you owe yourself is by picking something uh, that you really feel like if you didn't do it, you were really you would regret it. And that's what I did. And so um, I, I think that that along with betting on yourself, especially when you're younger, is very important. You know, before you get a wife, a husband, a partner, children, before you get constricted by these normal life choices, do it now. It's like, you know, there's so many things I wish I would have done at that age. I wish I would have studied abroad. That was like the number one thing that I wanted to do. And I didn't do it because I was thinking about the money and all this other stuff, even though I, I, all my internships was, were paid. I could not tell you what I did with this money. But if I had just buckled down a couple weeks, couple months, I could have made it overseas. It would have been fine. But part of it was a fear that I had about like, oh, living overseas and I don't know. And now all I do is travel in my free time. And it's a lot more expensive now than it probably was then. Uh, particularly with as big of a travel snob as I've become, but I've been to 33 countries. So it's like, imagine if I would have just followed my first mind when I was in college and taken that chance and, and lived overseas, it would have been the experience of a lifetime. So now is the time for you to make a lot of bold decisions. Um, I, I often get asked by people your age about making mistakes. Um, I don't really believe in mistakes. Uh, I believe that you're going to make the best out of the choice that you make. And I also believe everything happens for a reason. So if you're constantly under this anxiety that some decision that you make right now is going to shatter your life, well, you're actually kind of young enough to correct it, which is why I get all your stupid shit out of the way now. So do it now, and then you'll be able to, um, I think later on down the line, you'll be very happy that you didn't let these opportunities kind of go by. Can I just say before the next question, thank you for that. Um, I don't know that our staff, they said that they were academic coaches, but they, they're coaches to our 
freshman and sophomore um, students. And one of the things that we try to instill in them is to pursue their passion and not a job. And so I really appreciate that you said that. I hope that gets down into their spirits um, because like you say, if you pursue your passion, you will do it much better and it won't be work. So young people listen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not just saying it and, and trust me, uh, nobody programmed me to say that to you, but I just have, just in my experience, I just have noticed that I see a lot of young people, um, actually, unfortunately, it's people that I see my age who realize they wasted a lot of time on just kind of pursuing jobs and not really careers. I mean, there is a difference. And when they tried to turn it around, it's it kind of a little too late and they had a lot of regrets. And so that's why now is the opportunity and the chance even if you started in a certain direction, it's okay. You know, again, I was a special case because I identified what I wanted to do early and this is all that I've ever done. But the majority of people in their lives change careers three or four times. So it's not really all that unusual for you to A, be indecisive or B, get into something and realize that it's not quite what you expected or quite want to do. I mean, I tell people all the time that say they want to be a journalist I make sure that I'm very real with them about what this profession is. I mean, I'm, I live in Los Angeles right now, but this is the fifth city that I've lived in. Even when I worked at ESPN, I had to live four and a half years in Bristol, Connecticut. Nobody, when they're plotting out their career map says, you know where I want to live? Bristol, Connecticut. Like nobody says that, right? Uh, no disrespect if you're from Connecticut, sorry. But, um, you know, I've lived in a lot of different places. You know, when I was in, uh, in, interning a lot of different newspapers in college, I lived in Lima, Ohio. I lived in Cleveland. I lived in Philadelphia. I lived in Raleigh, North Carolina. I lived in a bunch of different places because part of what you have to do as a journalist, you have to go where the work is. You don't get to go where you want to go. You have to go where the work actually is. And so you have to be real with yourself and say, am I okay with going to places that were not on my vision board in terms of where I wanted to live? You can certainly try to navigate your career so you can live in places where you'd like to be. but guess what? Everybody wants to live in New York, LA, Miami. Everybody wants to live there. Sometimes where the work is, is West Virginia. Sometimes where the work is might be Memphis. So you have to ask yourself if that is the case, is this still something that I love? I would have loved being a sports journalist, whether I wound up on TV or ESPN or not, I still would have loved it. That didn't determine it. And so if you find that what you want to do is more about the things that it can give you and not about the actual work, you might want to reassess if whether or not this is something you actually want to do. Yes, and I just want to say, oh, sorry, I'm echoing everywhere. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you again for reminding us that it's okay to make mistakes. And you know, this is the time to make mistakes and go after your dreams. I feel like as college students, we forget that a lot. And we're always just like, what's the fastest route to the money, like you said earlier. Um, but my next question for you would be, uh, so professionally, you said that it's always good to hope for discomfort, and I would just like to hear a couple of thoughts on that. Yeah, um, if you think about the times where you do the most growth, it's usually when something um, uncomfortable has happened that has forced you to get to this point. Like, if you're always taking assignments that you know you can do that are so easy, then what's the point of taking them? Because how are they forcing you to challenge yourself in any possible way? So I always think it's a good idea to do something that you're not really certain you can accomplish. And I don't mean something that's so out of reach that you can't possibly succeed at it. I mean that something that you want to do, it's exhilarating, but it's also something that gives you a little bit of discomfort where you're like, oh, can I really do this? Well, we'll see, won't we? And so uh, that's kind of a lot how my television career was. Now, when I first got on TV and I was just kind of giving my opinion and, um, you know, it was pretty easy for me. Uh, you know, I wasn't camera shy. I wasn't nervous about being on television. So it was, it was, it was fine. Where I decided to challenge myself is to grow out of just being somebody who gave their opinion and try to be a host. You know, that meant, directing traffic and getting us in and out of commercial break and reading the prompter and doing, trying to really juggle 10 different things at once, all while being on live television. 
And the first couple of times I did it, I sucked. <laughs> and there's no question about it. I remember the uh, I was doing uh, first take and I had to fill in um, on ESPN. I, was, I had to fill in for a host that called in sick that day and they decided to give me a chance at it. And I was like, oh, it's like, this is a really great opportunity. I'm thinking to myself, but I'm also panicked because I've never hosted a television show a day in my life. And it was me and another uh, another host. And when, you know, we're on set and we're 30 seconds away from starting, I've written my script in the teleprompter, everything's all good. And I knew I had the first couple lines to say, just to welcome everybody and to tell them who was gonna be on the show that day. So the show finally starts, the camera comes around where I'm supposed to read what I'm supposed to say and it's a blank screen there's nothing on it and I did not remember what I was supposed to say so I'm literally on national tv like and luckily my co-host who's a savvy television um uh person who's been in it for years you know he, sensing my fright my fear and my utter confusion and my blankness he steps in you know maybe a, a 10 seconds may have gone by, but for me, it felt like 30 minutes, but he stepped in and said, oh, hey, welcome everybody to the show. I'm Michael Kim. Jamel, who do we have on the show today? And I was like, it clicked. I was like, oh, we have such and such. Keep in mind, nothing is impromptu. And so I just was like, hey, we got this, we got this, we're going to talk about this. And I just kind of did it off the top of my head. And that was my first lesson about hosting. Don't ever count on the prompter because it may not be there. And what happened was something had happened, some glitch, my script didn't load. And so it wasn't in there. And it happens quite frequently in television. And so uh, I, it made me also realize that's why you print out a copy of your script, <laughs> because then if you have it, and that's not to say you sit there and read it, but at least you can look down and know what's coming next and you have some ideas. Um, and yeah, I mean, it w it took a while for me to kind of warm up. I was so traumatized by what happened the first 30 seconds of the show. It took me a minute to kind of get back into the groove of it. And as comfortable, as uncomfortable as that made me and as I felt, I still wanted to host again. And there were plenty of other mishaps that happened while I was on television. But what happened is the more repetition I got, uh, the more experience I got, I realized that actually the mistakes kind of make the moment. And so one of the things that I think made my other, my first show at ESPN so good, his and hers, uh, that I co-hosted with my dear friend, Michael Smith, um, you know, for four years, is that whenever something crazy would happen, we found a way to make a joke out of it. And we found a way to include the audience. I remember one time we were on air and the lights went out in our studio and Mike immediately joked, he was like, who put the light bill in their daddy name? And it was just like, we just started going in. I was like, and then he told the story about, true story about how his mom, when he was growing up, actually put bills in his name. And when he got older, he realized his credit was a little ruined and it was hilarious, right? But that only happens if the lights go out on studio and instead of freaking out and be like, oh my God, the lights went out or asking to go to commercial, we sat there in the dark for about a good minute or so and entertain people, right? And so that's what you eventually get to once you get to a level of comfort, but it came from a place of discomfort is that you have so many crazy things that happen on live television that you eventually learn how to roll with the punches and you get really good out of navigating chaos. And so I strongly encourage everybody that in whatever it is you're doing, that you challenge yourself because the only way you're gonna be able to discover what you're made of or the greatness that's in you is if you put yourself in a position where you have to put things on the line, where you have to really challenge yourself um, to be great. That's the only way uh, you know that it happens. It doesn't happen um, by doing things that are easy. Um, you know, I, I think you you have a pretty good barometer of just who you are when things get difficult and what you're made of. Um, you know, are you the type of person that'll push through? Are you the type of person that'll give up? Will you be um, so fearful of the moment that you'll shrink? Well, you'll find out once you do something that makes you a little bit uncomfortable. I definitely agree with that statement when you said that um, 
that you know you 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 have to actually go out and do it you know just not don't be scared um just just try experiencing it because you will never experience you, like you will never have that experience if you never try and well and by I the way that, it's okay to be scared like we're all scared about certain things you just have to push through it um and it's normal to be that way but there's got to be something in you that when you feel the nerves at the pit of your stomach or even a little bit of anxiety there's got to be a different switch that you have that will make you go through with it anyway like I love roller coasters right but they do scare the shit out of me I gotta be honest like they do right okay so when I see one I'm just like oh that's great I'm also like but I could die but I'm gonna get on it anyway right so it's kind of like that same you know, mentality that you have to have is that, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go through this anyway, even though um, there's a part of me that is not real sure about how this is about to turn out. Agree. Um, so my next question for you is before you left ESPN, you said you had grown tired of trying to get, convince people to allow you to be yourself. Can you like talk a little bit more, uh, talk more about that? So my experience on Sports Center was not a good one, and um, even though you know it, it, it falls into the category of like sort of be careful what you wish for, and not that I wish to be a Sports Center anchor, but in our business is obviously a very high profile, it's one of the most premier jobs in sports television is that hosting Sports Center, a legacy show uh, at a legacy network, is is what people dream about doing. And um, it was kind of clear early on that we were going to have a lot of creative differences. Uh, if anybody watched our show, His and Hers, you know that we took a, a lot of chances. And for that matter, not only did we take a lot of chances, but we also pretty unapologetically Black, <laughs> okay, in those chances. And we were not going to, we weren't going to stop being ourselves to make other people comfortable or to fit more into the sports center brand. We still wanted to do and be us. And that was a fight, a daily fight. <laughs> and at some point you get tired of convincing people why it's a good reason for you to be you or feeling as if you are not somehow good enough, um, you know, for this particular platform. I got tired of it. And, um, it was mentally very draining. And so when I got an opportunity to leave, I left. And a lot of people thought it was ridiculous, thought it was crazy. Some people tried to generate the narrative that they kicked me off, even though I know it's in my contract. And in my contract, I was guaranteed to be on that show. So I didn't have to go anywhere, but I would have been very unhappy had I stayed. And I just didn't think my peace of mind was worth me being able to say, I'm the host of the 6 p.m. Sports Center. Just wasn't worth it to me. And I think this is why it was sort of, it was easy for me to leave it. Uh, and really in many respects, daily television overall. Like I haven't, I do a lot of TV, but I'm not on TV every day anymore. And I, I, I frankly enjoy that. Television was only so important to me. And so because it was only so important to me, it wasn't that hard for me to, to leave behind in that form. And so, um, you know, I think it's important that when you take jobs or when you look at jobs, I should say, that you look at what, what is it, you're, well, look at everything that you're taking on. And I think it's especially important that you, as much as possible, put yourself in a position where you can bring your full self to work. And uh, I was not in that position. And, um, you know, now I am. So I'm, you know, I'm grateful for having gone on that, gone through that. So now it makes me further appreciate where I am, you know, kind of currently. But uh, it's, uh, it's sometimes, especially, you know, if you're Black in corporate media um, or in, in corporate, you know, just in corporate America, period, that, uh, you know, you're going to go through a lot of these kind of as I call them, authenticity battles. You're going to go through a lot of them where you're going to often be in conversation, sometimes even be supervised by people who do not want to see you and your full Black self at work. And so you have to um, really 
navigate those spaces very carefully. And you probably will reach a point where you feel like it's kind of not worth it and that there's other avenues and other ways that you can go. And so, um, yeah, for me, it was just that um, the experience, while I learned a lot, and while we certainly had some good moments, it, it wasn't all bad, that it wasn't really worth it to me. You know, I, I'm I'm not going to sit up here and try to convince you of my worth. That's just not going to happen. I'm just not built that way. And so um, I had to, you know, ultimately, it was much better for me from a, a mental standpoint and from a career standpoint, I think. It, it was much better for me to leave. Um, I think that is very, very important finding work that you find um, fulfilling and, you know, um, but we'd also like to open up the, the chat if you have any questions, but right now um, we do have a question from Dr. Frank Harris III. He says, can you talk about the podcast with Carrie Champion and the platform it's providing for other women of color who are addressing the issues of racial justice? Uh, okay, and thank you for your question. Uh, I assume you might be talking about our show on Vice uh, called Won't Stick to Sports um, that I have with Carrie, who also is a former ESPN alum, just like I am. And the reason that we chose that network and to title the show that was because that, you know, prior to 2020, there ha was a lot of conversations about how sports shouldn't be political, how people did not think sports was an appropriate place to talk about social justice, racial issues, gender issues, which was always very intellectually dishonest because if you have any cursory knowledge of sports history, even American history, but let's just stick to sports history, you know that racial and gender issues and social issues have always been in the pot of sports. It's never not been a part of the existence of sports. You know, Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball in 1947, which was, you know, pretty much about 20 years before the Civil Rights Act was passed. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was a seminal moment in this country because a country already that was talking about integration, seeing, um, you know, the, the evils and the dangers of segregation, uh, here you have in sports, this has happened well ahead of its time. And sports has always kind of, in many respects, kind of played that role of, of being a little bit ahead of the rest of, of, of society. And as a result, uh, because of sports, you get an opportunity to talk about these very important issues. Um, think about, you know, you know, where Colin Kaepernick plays in the larger story of how we discuss police brutality now. It was, it's always been evident in our community, in our society, police brutality has been an issue. Uh, but obviously the conversation went to a different level, um, you know, after Michael, after uh, Michael Brown and Ferguson. And so from there, you go to the WNBA players, speaking out uh, when Philando Castile was murdered to Colin Kaepernick. And now, you know, you see where we are and you see what the NBA's reaction was last year when Jacob Blake was shot multiple times by the police. So there seemed to be a real opportunity to discuss these issues. And Carrie and I were often told in the last few years that we should stick to sports. Uh, a lot of Black journalists, frankly, were told the same thing uh, whenever we tried to bring these other elements into discussions about sports, um, especially when it was very obvious. And so the, the title of the show was a bit of a middle finger to the people who kept telling us to stick to sports. And on the show, all we did was talk about everything that wasn't sports <laughs> or talk about all those uncomfortable things that people didn't want to talk about with sports or allow athletes to voice their opinions about these things, which they also didn't particularly like either. I mean, our first guest was LeBron James. And we spent a lot of time talking about, a lot of that interview talking about voting and his voting initiative, uh, more than a vote and why this was important to him and mobilizing the black community. And these are conversations that in mainstream sports, they don't really wanna have. Um, and it was very cathartic for us to be able to provide that platform. But most importantly, 
from an optic standpoint to show other, you know, young black women, um, other black women, period, that there was space for us to talk about these things and that, um, you know, there was not only space for us, but there was a need for us to be able to do it as well. And so uh, it was a, a real pleasure for us to be able to go in collaboration with Vice to do that because Vice is a different kind of network. You know, a lot of networks don't have the courageousness to um, support talent that talks about issues the way in which Carrie and I did. And, um, or to, you know, <laughs> I mean, some of think about some of the things we did in the first season that really pissed people off. And there's a lot of networks that would not have been able to handle that. I mean, I sat on the set one day, I did a little monologue drinking from a cup that said white tears on it. <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> As, uh, but you know, a lot of networks probably wouldn't let that happen, right? You know, I drank Hennessy on air too, so <laughs> it's like this is what we do. But um, yeah, it was it was good. We wanted to just show, you know, black women, especially during this time where we're seizing our own power in a lot of ways, that our voices are necessary. Uh, they need to be heard, and they should be amplified and supported. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, so you had mentioned early, a little bit before about the, the tweet. Um, so my question now is, if you had tweeted about Trump being about being a, a white supremacist today, do you think you had received a different response versus a couple of years ago? Um, well, one thing that's different is the former president is banned from Twitter, so he wouldn't have tweeted about me, I guess. So that might not have happened. But I, I think it would have been a much different scenario. Um, yeah, I, I think it would have definitely still caused the ESPN some discomfort, for sure. But in terms of it being the flashpoint that it was, I don't think so, because now everybody calls him that. And they pretty much call a president a racist like it's his middle name, so or former president. I mean, that's I remember thinking that during the the presidential debate is like virtually every nominee, every presidential candidate called him a racist or a white supremacist, one or the other. And it's just like, oh yeah, this is, this is what it is. And so I think because there's just such a mountain of evidence to support it. And when I tweeted it, it was never from a place of emotion. To me, it was, it was from a place of fact. And, um, but at the time you had the combination of not just me saying it, but me saying it as being a ESPN anchor on a major daily show for them at a time where not a lot of people, people were pondering it. And it had been said, I was not the first person to say it. Uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates laid out this incredible essay in the Atlantic, where I obviously now work, where he laid out the case of, uh, I think the, um, the the title of his essay was called the headline was uh donald trump is the is the first uh white president i think that's what it was and it was a just a beautifully written piece and it explains you know why he was a white supremacist so i wasn't the first person to say it and i've often said and i still stand by it like it's one of the most unoriginal things i've ever said because i didn't really think it was breaking news and i didn't think it was not obvious so I was just as surprised as everyone else by the widespread reaction for something like that to reach all the way to the White House. That just seemed so inconceivable to me because I don't know why the president or anybody in his administration should care what a sports center anchor says about them. Uh, I would have liked to think that they had much bigger problems than that, uh, but it sort of was the president, um, the former president, um, it was kind of what he was known for, was often reacting to things said about him in the media. So I guess from that standpoint, I should have been surprised. But nevertheless, I was very surprised that the reaction was as, um, was as not just swift, but just was as voluminous as it was. Can I ask a follow-up? Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys. So, um, so I'm just wondering, if you think that Trump felt like he could opine on what you were saying because 
when he, uh, you know, when he talked about the football players, you know, if they want to protest, kick him out the country or, you know, or got with the owners to essentially blackball cap, um, he probably felt like he could do that with anybody. I, I mean, he certainly, there was certainly, certainly a uh, blueprint in which he followed. I mean, he had attacked Maxine Waters, Frederica Wilson. I mean, there was a long line of people of color, women, black women, and that he'd attacked. Uh, and I, as we see, one of the part of his blueprint is weaponizing his followers to strong arm you. And that's very real. And so even now, where especially after this insurrection where we talked about the dangers of his um you know rhetoric and how he can galvanize very hateful people very quickly and very strongly i mean it's real i mean i still get death threats um for a long time i mean it was bad and uh i think that was that's part of his retribution that he likes to hand out and he you know, because he is somebody who is overly obsessed with what people say um, about him. And I think the fact that he was ESPN, I don't know, if, I mean, if I'm at a lesser known, like if I'm on local television, I don't think he cares about that. But because it was ESPN, that, that of course, piqued his interest. And so, um, you know, I, I think it was just a lot of different, you know, factors, but uh, I think he often liked to use his social media and just his megaphone period to bully other people. And so, um, you know, I caught the, I caught the brunt of it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, before I get into the next question, it looks like we have one in the chat. Oh, we have two. Okay. So I'll ask the first one. Um, this is from Aaliyah Unique. She says, hi, I'm a high school student. I want to start a vlog that explores issues that people my age deal with. What is some advice you have or you could give me to, as to get started? Well, uh, great idea. I mean, one of the things that I think this generation definitely has a big advantage is the fact that you don't really have to wait for somebody to give you a platform. You can take your own platform. Uh, you know, you can start your own YouTube channel. Um, you can just go live on Instagram. Like there's a lot of different ways you should do it. Uh, I would just say, um, think very critically about what you're going to say, give it some thought, do your research. Um, and if you can, get an editor. Um, and by that, I mean, like, if you, a friend that you trust, have them look, look it over. Um, don't just hit send out into the world. I mean, I think, you know, put yourself in a position where you have to be edited, for lack of a better way to put it, because it'll make you better you know, to have a different set of eyes on it, to have somebody who will critique you and give you an honest and fair critique. And also be aware of who's watching. And by that, I mean this, is that um, whatever you decide to do, and the reason I stress you do it in a thoughtful and critical way, is that if you plan to do this at some point in your life, if you plan to, you know, be on camera in any capacity, nothing's ever dead on the internet. So whatever it is you put out there, be sure it's something you can be proud of and something that will represent the best of who you are. Because once you put yourself out there, um, sort of a, a image takes shape. And so you have to make sure that you're very careful about what that image is and what you wanna show people um, and how you want uh, your thoughts and your critiques and your messaging to be received. And so be very careful with that uh, because certainly I know of a lot of employers that do a lot of deep social media dives into people's accounts so they can find out exactly who they are. And so you should see it as, or treat it as that someday, somebody who might wanna hire you is going to watch this. What will they think when they watch it? And if you are comfortable with that and feel good about what you're showing, then, then great. It could be a really advantageous tool for you to, to gain some experience and even beyond all that, just make sure you're always pushing yourself. Um, you know, there's a lot of topics out there, a, a lot of people in the vlogosphere, it's, a, it's saturated. So make sure what you say will stand out and not because it's outlandish, 
not because it's reckless, but because it's smart. And, you know, do some research, check out what's already out there, check out what people are talking about, and try to hit on issues that aren't as saturated that people don't really know about or you feel like need to be educated on. Yes, thank you. And that question was actually from Dr. Reddick's granddaughter, which is really <laughs> cute. So hopefully she took that <laughs> advice to heart, especially on, you know, making yourself stand out by posting smart content or things that you want to educate others on. Uh, before I ask my next question, there is one more in the chat. This is from Nandi. She says, from sports to film to the Black Lives Matter movement, there is so much discourse in the media about Blackness and Black people that it can get mudded and complicated really quickly. How have you carved out space for yourself in the entertainment industry as a Black woman, specifically talking about Black issues? Yeah, I mean, it can get complicated. Nuance is kind of dead <laughs> sometimes. But that's what I specialize in. And even though I think there's a lot of temptation in this media landscape to come to conclusions quickly and to be on either side of the outrage uh, that I try to sort of stand out by leaning into the complicated part, um, that things that aren't necessarily a yes or no answer, that there's an easy conclusion to be drawn, teachable moments, um, I'm big on those. And so I think, uh, I think I have to approach what I do with a certain amount of grace for people. And I think some of that comes with age and wisdom where the older you get, um, there's, a more, there's a more grace that you have. Um, me and Michael Eric Dyson, uh, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, uh, my brother from Detroit, we had a great conversation about this. And he, he said the same thing is that, um, you know, the older he gets, the more grace he asks for. And I think it's important that they see things through that perspective. Now, look, I, there are times where I wield Thor's hammer just like the rest of everybody else. And that's fine. I, I think there's times and moments for that as well. But I also think that we should embrace the complications. Um, and, you know, I think people are learning, believe it or not, even though it's 2021, that Black people are not a monolith. And even though we do, it, it can be confusing for people who are on the outside to understand how we have, how we're not a monolith, we're complicated and have relatable experiences all at the same time. It, you know, there's, there's a shared experience that we have, but we're all very different. And so I think the fascinating part is the differences, you know, frankly. And that's the part that I find to be most compelling. And so, you know, even when I have guests on my podcast is that that's the part I'm thinking about, you know, the most is, you know, yeah, when I'm interviewing Daniel Kaluuya, given all this conversation about whether or not Black British actors should be playing historical African-American roles. Uh, you know, I want to dig into what his racial experiences were like in Britain, because I think we don't understand that racism and white supremacy is a global problem. America did not invent this. It may have perfected it in some ways, but did not invent it necessarily. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's an important conversation to have about this, pr pr this proprietary sense that we have over Blackness. You know, whenever Black people have conversations about trying to define what Blackness is or trying to have the who's really Black, it always leads to a bad place. I've never seen this lead to a good place. And so I'm, I think it's in, important that we dig into those reasons and why they're there and our complications and our trauma and um, not be afraid of what it might say about us. I mean, we judge each other very harshly. Uh, a lot of times. And I think a lot of that is a product of the things that we've been through and the generational trauma that we carry. But I also think it is what leads to the greatest understanding if we're willing to really step in there and have some uncomfortable but enlightening conversations. So I guess they, you know, to answer the question, I, I stand out because I lean into the into the complicated part. Thank you. Thank you. Lean into the complicated, I love. Okay, so um, I have one last question for you and then I'm gonna open the floor up to the rest of the audience, just in case anybody else has any questions. 
So I'm really excited about this one because I want to see what you're up to. So you, I heard you and your best friend have a production company together. And I was wondering yeah. if you can tell us a little bit about some projects that you have been working on lately. Yeah. Um, so we have a production company. Um, my best friend, uh, Kelly Carter, who's a senior entertainment critic at The Undefeated, um, ESPN's The Undefeated. And so we've been best friends for, gee, it might be almost. 30 years now and um she was made an honor in my wedding yeah so she, I, <laughs> KK I saw you going wow guess what it'll be you soon <laughs> you look up and you're just like oh my god this is my college roommate and we're now in our 40s and we're still working <laughs> and so it comes faster than you think but um we you know the the great thing about being a journalist is that uh, you know, we love stories and we love storytelling and we like to think we know what a good story is, which makes it, uh, a, a, which is a great skill to have when you have a production company. And so um, we are working on a multitude of projects. Uh, right now, probably front and center. Um, and the one that most people have heard about is this uh, comedy series that we're developing with Gabrielle Union uh, and that we were able to sell to Showtime, which we're very excited about. It is um, you know, we like to think it'll be a very different kind of comedy series than what people have seen revolving around, you know, two Black women. And we, we have been very careful with how we try to explain what it is just because we do not want people thinking this is our lives, okay? Now, there are very loose, inflated situations they have taken from our lives, but this is not biographical in any resort, in any respect, because the last thing uh, we need is old boyfriends calling us be like was that me like I don't need that in my life at all so but what we wanted to do was approach it from a, a different angle where you know I mean Insecure is a great show and Atlanta is a great show but these are mostly about young people who are um, you know kind of in that come up phase um, you know that's the whole beauty of Atlanta is like watching Earn struggle and like finally get his stuff together, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, with Insecure, you have this friendship that is trying to survive the ups and downs of navigating adult life. And so our one of our elevator pitches uh, to when we were having meetings and pitching it to different networks was, imagine if Molly and Issa had grown up and got all their stuff together. That's what this is, okay? So uh, the series is titled New Money and you know, we were just thinking about how now, you know, Black women are the most educated group in the country. We're the only um, gender group that owns more businesses than our male ethnic counterparts. So it's more Black women that own businesses than Black men. Uh, there's, you know, we now have a, a Black woman who's a vice president of the United States. So there's a lot of Black women out there who are seizing quite a bit of power. Um, professionally in many, many regards. And so um, we wanted to have a comedy series that reflected those complications of being accomplished, you know, women, where even though you may have new money, that there's still a lot of old problems that will follow you. So we're, um, we're really excited about, you know, that we have some other things in development, and we're, you know, hoping to, you know, make a Another big announcement soon, <laughs> and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Yay, that sounds so cool. Everybody stay on the lookout for new money. <laughs> um, okay, so now we want to open up the floor to the audience and allow them to ask a couple of questions. So you guys can raise your hand, put it in the chat or unmute yourself. Anything works. Hey, go ahead, Shaki. First, I just want to thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate everything that you have talked about today. And so similarly to you, I can't, my whole passion, my whole life has been sports and coming into college, uh, I'm a communications major and I wanted to be a sports analyst just like you. And what I realized of taking these AFRAS courses by Dr. Reddick. I have never, I've never taken any courses like this in my life or been been exposed to this material. 
So I realized that maybe sports analysts, um, like maybe the sports analyst route wasn't particularly just for me because I understood that my voice could be way bigger. When you look at James Baldwin or when you look at Frederick Douglass or all of these magnificent black leaders, they were never subjected to just one thing. So when did you realize that your voice was bigger than sports? Um, well, I mean, that's a bit of a complicated question to a- to answer because, um, and I would actually disagree because you don't think Muhammad Ali had a pretty big voice? I mean, I think he had a pretty big voice. <laughs> he was a boxer <laughs> and he was in sports. Um, I think what, what it is, this is the, the power that sports gives you that maybe other things don't. Sports is one of the few things we still do together. It's, it's like we don't worship together. Most of us eat with the same type of people. Sports, though, you know, when it's, uh, look at what happens when it's the Olympics. We might not even care about a sport. And next thing you know, everybody's rooting for this to happen. Um, in sports, it just has a, a way of bringing people together in a different way. And that's why I love sports. And it get, gives you an entry point to talk about the same thing, you know, um, that you talk about in other ways, but the audience just may hear you a little differently because it is sports. Um, you know, maybe there are people who honestly didn't care about voting, but they saw LeBron James talk about voting and create an entire voting initiative that, uh, you know, may have really helped to swing an election and it might've just hit differently because of who LeBron James is, is because he's internationally known. And I do think that sports gives you an incredible power to reach people that you may not have been able to, to reach otherwise. That being said, I don't think you have to make a hard choice and say like, oh, I'm not going to, um, you know, I'm not going to talk about sports. I'm going to talk about these other things. What you'll find is that there's so much overlap. And, you know, I've spent you know, a lot of today and after I get off with you guys, I'm doing Don Lemon show because it's Tiger Woods because of what happened. And they not only want to just talk about the accident, they want to talk about how Tiger Woods was able to do something that we hadn't seen before. And um, not just from what he accomplished as a golfer, you know, winning eight and, you know, 80, what is, I think it's 86 PGA tour victories, five masters and most recent one in 2019. But you know, he brought Black people into golf in a much different way than what we've ever seen. There's a possibility for a broader conversation. You look at, you know, Serena Williams, whose very existence in the white world of tennis feels like an act of resistance. And she's been doing this for 20 years. And we talk about potentially the greatest athlete of all time. And so these are the things that sports allows you to do and to talk about. I can talk about gender and the unique challenges and the ways in which Black women, our aggression is perceived. And I could do that through Serena Williams. So I I would argue that sports gives you the perfect platform to make your voice as big as you want it, you know, to be. Um, You know, the one thing I will say about, you know, being an analyst, I think the tricky part is establishing your credibility, giving people the why of why they should listen to you. Um, My, my, um, entry point into being an analyst because you know obviously being a woman I wasn't you know I wasn't I didn't have the opportunity to play professional football but what I did do is that you know I spent a great number of years as a reporter covering college football covering college basketball high school sports the NFL Super Bowls all sorts of things and I covered so many events and so many teams and had so um you know so many sources in different leagues that I could speak with authority about what I was talking about. And so whatever kind of analyst you're going to have to come become, you have to establish the credibility first. What is your credibility? Why should people listen? And so once you get that part first, you can very easily command your ability to analyze in whatever way that you want. And you can use sports as an entry point or you can uh, use it as a springboard. But, you know, I do still think it's, you know, it's a valuable, you know, tool in terms of uh, trying to be able to, to reach broader audiences. 
you know, 100 million people watch the Super Bowl. It's a pretty big audience. So the reach any given night when you, especially during the NFL, most of the top programs are sports. So it's like our addiction with sports in this country, um, you know, if you pursue this, it gives you a pretty big entry point with millions of people. Thank you so much. And thank you, Shaki, for that question. Um, if there's any more questions, um, you can raise your hand or put it in the chat. But my question for you actually is, you know, the whole topic of this discussion in the first place is how do you navigate um, as a Black woman in a white male space? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I would say this is that, um, I think it's important wherever you go. Um, you need to know who you are before you step through whatever door you enter into. And if you know who you are, the things that happen there, even if they're things that are challenging, it won't change who you are. And so using ESPN as an example, I had a very strong sense of who I was before I got there. And so there was nothing that was going to happen there that was going to compromise me or change me. And I think already in your mind, you have to know what your boundaries are and what you're not willing to compromise. And once you kind of establish that, how you go about protecting that, it can vary from place to place, but the whole point is to protect it. And if you know that, you know, hey, this is my line, have that established and know that if it comes down to it and you have to lose some footing or lose an assignment or even lose a job over it, um, while not ideal, it's easier to do when you know what you stand for. And so I've always had a very keen understanding of what I stand for. And, you know, at times, those times where it's popped up where that was, it was threatened to be compromised, then, you know, because I already knew what I was willing to lose and I was all right with that, it actually made the fight a lot simpler. It's, it's when you're sort of trying to figure out your integrity on the fly is when it gets a little bit more complicated. But when you already have a sense of what that is, then it, 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 you'd be surprised at how much better that comes in navigating spaces. And also, you know, look, it, there are things, and I made this point earlier and I think it bears repeating, there are battles you will not pick at 23 that you will definitely pick at 33. There are battles that you won't, there are battles that you will pick at 33 and even more ones you'll pick at 43, right? And so I say all that to say is that don't go into it thinking, especially as you're starting out and you're trying to develop and establish and get that equity, don't feel as if you have to fight everyone fight the ones that are the most important and build from there. Um, because again, it's gonna change over time. And especially as you get more leverage, you're gonna be able to swing the hammer the way you want to. And you have to be strategic about it, you know, frankly, because there's gonna be times where you're gonna have to, as I like to say, let some fish swim by, <laughs> okay? And, but do it with the, long-term planning in mind of knowing that you're willing to sacrifice maybe the short-term gratification of reading somebody with the long-term um, goal of being extremely successful and that hurting them more <laughs> okay so um so yeah i mean it, it is gonna it, a lot of it is gonna come by feel and you probably will make some you know mistakes but that's why I, I, you know I, I do think it's important that wherever you work and especially when you're in corporate America, is that you need to have kind of um, three different things. You need to have some mentors, and your mentors won't don't always have to be people who are necessarily above you. Some of your best mentors can honestly be people who are at the same level as you are, because really the point of a mentor is for somebody to be a sounding board, somebody who can give you some advice, you know, somebody you can kind of really open up with and share. Um, 
And I don't think you should ever pick mentors based off resume because there's a lot of people who ask me to be their mentor, but they're only asking to be me to be it because of what my resume may look like. Or, you know, they're like, oh, you're this successful. I want to be that too, be my mentor. But as I tell them, I'm like, how do you even know I'll make a good mentor? You don't know anything about me. That'd be terrible. Like, I really could be terrible. I mean, so it's like, it's got to be more than that. Like, that's got to really be a personal relationship. But there's a difference between a mentor, an ally, and a sponsor. Because really, you may not want that person to be a mentor. You may actually be asking them to be a sponsor. And by a sponsor, I mean somebody who, will, okay, you know, you can show them what you're capable of, show them what you'll do, show them your resume. And all you need from them is to put in a good word for you somewhere. Be like, hey, I'm applying for this. Do you mind putting in a word for me? I didn't do that. That's cool. That's not the same as being a mentor, <laughs> right? That's a sponsor. And so, and look, people will tell you that are my age and my position, we're okay with you being real with us about what, what you want. Like, don't ask me to be a mentor when you actually just want a sponsor. I'm cool with being a sponsor. I ain't tripping, you know? And then it comes to an ally. An ally is somebody that when they're in those rooms and having those discussions about assignments, about things or whatever, who's going to be the person in the room that's going to bring your name up? So you have to develop allies, not only to get you to those assignments and to those positions that you want to be in, but also you need an ally because if something does go down at work, who do you have around you that will have your back? that's in a position to do something back about it if they come for you. So you always have to have those in your back pocket. So when you go into these workplaces, especially these majority white working spaces, be very clear about who these people are. And especially on the allyship, because you're going to need some white allies. It's just what it is. <laughs> I mean, it is true. It's like you go, because most of them have the decision-making position. So you, when it goes down, and or when Frank say something that you need to check his microaggression about, you gonna need that one ally because when you cuss out Frank and Frank gonna run into the bosses, then that boss is gonna have your back because you've developed them as an ally. So even as you are trying to, you know, grow as a professional, you have to be always thinking about what are the angles because that microaggression, that big aggression is going to come. That moment where you're going to want to cut somebody out at work is going to happen. And now it's just going to, how can you minimize and mitigate that moment and manage it and, and, and honestly narrate it for yourself and not leave it for others? Like, how can you control the situation if that happens? So be sure you have your strategy in place when you do that. And so that's honestly, it's through standard strategy is how you navigate white working spaces you know and so um i've been lucky enough that at places i've worked i've been able to outthink the people that are you know that that are coming for me or even if there's somebody who's standing in my way i've been usually able to you know navigate around them because you know i always had a big joker in the pocket you know <laughs> Thank you so much, um, especially like as a black college student on a predominantly white campus. That was a lot of lot of good advice and also um, touching on the mentorship. You know, that's what's so good about the HGS program. Tyree's actually my mentor. So, you know, I'll always that's have great. that. <laughs> and then Dr. Reddick, Aaliyah, Dr. Green, they are like our allies, like they will fight for us in any space, anytime, anywhere, like they're there for us. But um, thank you everybody for your attendance and participation. Can we please give one final round of applause using the clapping feature or unmuting yourself <laughs> for our wonderful guest speaker, Ms. Jamel Hill. Um, and thank you, Ms. Hill, for giving us your time and your words of wisdom. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, and um, good luck, everybody. Oh, yeah, see the, I see the clapping emoji. <laughs> uh, yes, good luck, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed the, um, the conversation, and, and hopefully uh, I left you something that you can think about. So appreciate you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, take care. <laughs>